and welcome to First Christian Church of Burbank, a community of faith that strives to be a welcoming and loving space. So no matter where you are on life's journey, whatever brings you to this service, we want to know, we want you to know that you are welcome here and we believe God loves you. With that said, we have folks in the sanctuary and on uh, Facebook Live. Uh, Facebook Live is a great space to interact virtually, so you are welcome to join us on Facebook Live, even if you're in the sanctuary, to use the comment section for prayers, to greet one another, or however you uh, might utilize that space. If you are joining us virtually, please let us know where you're joining us from. It reminds us that we remain connected and united in God's love during a still difficult time. Also, we will share prayers later in the service, and if you feel comfortable using that space to share your prayers, please do so. If you don't feel comfortable in that space, reach out to one of the elders or me after the service, and we'll make sure to include your prayers in our prayer life. Also, you will see candles um, next to me. Feel free to come up and light candles during the service for prayers, for peace, whatever you feel called to do. Also, you can use the time at the end of the service to do that as well. 
And a reminder that Nellie is operating under a hybrid model for Sunday school in the children's room. You can use that space. And if you're virtually joining us virtually and want more information or the link to join them, please reach out to us during the week and we'll make sure to include you um, in those communications. Also, uh, communion is still being done with those little all-in-one communion cups, which are near the entryway. Um, if you're joining us virtually, grab whatever communion elements you have near you, a donut, a glass of water, because we will break bread later in the service, and all are welcome to partake, partake in that meal. Finally, we return to the reminder that this is a loving and welcoming community of faith. However you join us today, whatever brings you to this service, know that you are welcome here. And now as we move deeper into worship, I invite you to stand as you are able and join together in song. When I wake up in the morning, I'm gonna walk in love. When the evening sun is falling, I'm gonna walk in love. Through the troubles of the day, Green. 
fed pain You choose again to rise You choose to bless the name That's a little stone, that's a little mortar That's a little sea, that's a little water In the hearts of the sons and daughters This kingdom's coming That's a little stone, that's a little mortar That's a little sea, that's a little water In the hearts of the sons and daughters This kingdom's coming come to that time in our service in which we offer prayers. Prayers for this world, prayers for this community, and even prayers for our families and friends. Like I said at the beginning of the service, if you have a prayer you'd like to share, please do that on Facebook Live. If you don't feel comfortable in that space, reach out to the leadership after worship and we'll make sure to include your prayer in our prayer life. I will share a prayer from this community and then end it with God in your mercy. I invite you to respond with hear our prayers. And so we begin, as we do every week, by giving thanks for a loving community of faith that remains connected during a challenging time. And so let us give thanks for this community. God, in your mercy. We also give thanks for the volunteers who make every worship service possible. In particular this week, we give thanks for Dave and Todd, who were the ones who secured the palm branches for worship today. I invite you to ask them. <laughs> to, in a prayerful way, ask them where they got the palm branches. But indeed, we give thanks for their courage and willingness to secure those. God, in your mercy. <laughs> we also give thanks for our partners in ministry, like Burbank Temporary Aid Center, Homemade Thursdays, Project Mercy, Family Promise, and so many others that keep us deeply connected to our community. God, in your mercy. This day we also hold in prayer Robert Rojas and his family as they prepare for the celebration of Robert's mother's life this coming Monday. Robert, please know that you and your entire family will be in our prayers. And if you're interested in supporting Robert in person, reach out to me and I'll provide you the address for where that is happening Monday evening from 4 to 8. But let us keep Robert and his family in prayer. God, in your mercy. We also pray the, for the following people in our community who continue to face some kind of medical under, uncertainty. So we continue to pray for Janine, Pam J, Carlos, Stan, Britt, Brian and Nancy, Amy, Gina and, For, Gina and Forrest, and so many others. God, in your mercy. We also have a prayer request from Lisa Poole today, whose father, Mike Smith, had a stroke in March. May we continue to pray for Lisa, her family, her father, and for healing and hope. God, in your mercy. Also, we continue to pray for Ken Trutner, who I visited yesterday and is still recovering for nearly two months ago, being hit by a truck. Indeed, his bones and his body are healing. He was even positive on an upbeat yesterday, saying his one goal was to get out of that re rehab facility. So let us keep Ken and his family in prayer. God, in your mercy. We also pray for those in assisted living facilities, such as Janet, Paul, and Audrey, and those who seek to care for them. God, in your mercy. 
And for those who were online or in person last week, we had a challenging presentation in worship that reminded us painfully of colonization and the deep history of our country. If you want more information, please see me after worship, but let us take a moment to pray for our community, for those who were hurt by last week's presentation, and for the ways in which we move in language of love, justice, and hope. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for Ukraine and all countries that are facing violence, unwelcomed war, and those who are displaced and result in refugee status in those countries and around the world. God, in your mercy. Finally, we turn our attention back to this community of faith. May we continue to pray for and have the courage to be a community of faith that embraces God's unending love, mysterious hope, and powerful peace. God, in your mercy. Let us continue this time of prayer in song. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God, you whose love remains, we give thanks for the ways in which that love moves into this space and into our very lives. We give thanks for the opportunity to gather in this space to welcome one another and to welcome that same spirit of love. And as we enter this space, we come with many things we are wrestling with. 
Some are coming with great joy and thanksgiving. Others are coming a bit confused and wondering what might be next. Still others come into this space with deep grief and trepidation. And we know that that same spirit of love holds each and every one of us, no matter how we walk through these doors. Or what sounds occur in this space. Or if we gather virtually, we know that you welcome us regardless and give thanks for that. For you indeed have heard our prayers this morning. Prayers for communities facing war. Prayers of thanksgiving for volunteers. Prayers for partnerships that make a difference in our community. Prayers for health and healing. Again, wrap those prayers in your unending love. And as we offer these prayers, may we become prayers in action. That when we pray for love, we embody love. When we pray for healing, that we offer a gracious and loving touch to others. And when we pray for peace, may we be a peaceful presence in this world. And we offer all of these prayers, trusting that indeed in the mystery of your loving presence, you hear and hold them. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's scripture is going to be Luke 19, 28 through 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as, as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God of ancient story and loving presence, open us this day to a well-read, well-known story and to your call. In your name we pray, amen. And even the stones will cry out. And even the stones will cry out. Ends Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. I say that in case you want to open that up on your smartphone and follow along. But that's how the story ends today. There is a move from the leaders of that time to silence the people around them. But Jesus, in a quick turn, turns to them that even if the voices were silent in that space, the stones would cry out. And it might seem like a common phrase, or we might gloss right over it. But it's a deep theological claim and reminder that even when silence stalks us, God's presence and God's voice moves beyond that. Even when the realities of this world threaten to overwhelm us, somehow God's voice still speaks. And so we stand here on Palm Sunday. And those who have been part of church communities for a while might be looking around and saying, oh, I know those palm branches or seeing the images or the words or the stories might, know, might say, I've heard this before. This is a common 
and well-rehearsed story. And my guess is some of you might have already tuned out or thinking, I can get in a quick nap this morning before we get to communion. But I instead invite us for a moment to step into the serious nature and reality of this story and the ways in which we stand at the edge of a very powerful and profound week. Between now and next Sunday, some of us will take the journey of this week that will take us to all kinds of voices, all kinds of things crying out. In the depth and breadth of this week, the stories that we will rehearse will take us, as I said, to all kinds of voices. Voices of pain and discomfort. Voices of joy and community. Voices of grief and deep questioning. But I invite us to rest on the theological truth that ends this very story. That no matter how those voices are articulated this week, no matter what happens, God's voice and God's love persist. And that is what will cry out. And that is what will be made known. And you might be saying, Brandon, you're getting a little serious. It's Palm Sunday. Hail Hosanna. Wave those branches. But in the shadows of those branches, we are reminded of a very real and human experience and where this week will take us. And so let me remind you that as, as we step away from these palms and the hail and Hosanna, we will begin to venture into a very dark and human week. We will encounter Monday, Thursday, and rehearse the stories of that last night Jesus had with his disciples, a night in which he breaks bread, names his betrayer, and reminds his disciples once again of the fullness and the weight of what is yet to come. And then we'll stop at Good Friday and be reminded of the full brutality and reality of the Roman Empire. And not just the Roman Empire, but the violent systems that persist in our world and seek to undo humanity to its core. And then a week from today, we'll enter Easter Sunday. But we're not there yet. We're still at Palm Sunday. And so I invite us to step back into the Palm Sunday space and using our theological imagination to imagine the lives of three characters that find themselves in this story. They're not named in what Mario just wonderfully read, but I believe we're invited to read between the lines and to investigate the stories of those who stood in the crowd that day and to imagine the steps that they will begin to take this week. And so for a moment, I invite you to step into that scriptural and theological imagination as Serene Jones identifies, Serene Jones identifies, and begin to not only hear their stories, but hear our stories as well. And so I first invite our imaginations to stop at a well-known character, Peter. Peter, the one who was renamed and the one who, on which Jesus would build this movement of love and God's hope and kingdom. Here in that crowd on Palm Sunday, he is excited. His body is full of excitement of what is to come. He sees the crowds that are beginning to surround Jesus and yell, Hail, Hosanna. And I can imagine the dream and vision he had for God's kingdom, the words of Jesus that he hung on, are finally becoming reality. For far too long, Peter has seen a world of hurt, pain, and desperation. But in this parade and in this procession, he gets a glimmer of what is possible, of the hope and excitement of his people. And I believe he turns probably to a stranger and whispers, can you feel it? Can you see it? 
God's dream, God's vision at last. But we know where Peter's story continues. That excitement wanes. That energy dissipates. And he denies even knowing his friend. He denies the very essence of God that he was so excited about. And so I invite us to hold Peter and to see the very real and human nature of that story. The excitement held with the disappointment. God's vision of love and hope with the very real, the very real disappointment of this world. And so I invite our theological imaginations to move from Peter to an unnamed mother in that crowd. A mother who for her whole life had witnessed the brutality of Rome, who had probably lost her husband and a son or two to that brutality, who entered that moment with the full weight and grief that the world places upon a woman like that, who had far too often said goodbye to those she'd known and loved, who held the weight of poverty and desperation in her bones. But like Peter, on that Palm Sunday, she saw a glimmer of hope. Her pain, her weight, was suddenly being lifted and taken away. She was held, she was loved. The hope that she'd longed for finally was on a donkey walking into Jerusalem. The very shackles of the world that had held her back were being released for a moment. All that pain, all those tears, all that loss were released for a moment. And as we move from Peter and the unnamed mother, we then rest our eyes and our theological imagination on one who had been healed. The one who was once blind could now see. The one who had experienced the weight of isolation and marginalization he'd experienced in that society when he'd been pushed out of communities because his body was somehow culturally incomplete. He had been healed but a few weeks earlier. He'd known the loving power of Jesus' touch, and he'd for once experienced that notion of shalom and healing. He stood in that crowd. He saw the hope of God's love and God's peace slowly march towards Jerusalem. His prayers seemingly were being answered in the hail Hosanna. The hope of his body was finally being realized. And so I invite our theological imaginations to see Peter, the unnamed mother and the one who had been healed in that crowd that day. And in ways mysteriously and unknown, I invite you to also see your stories in those people. I imagine you know Peter's story. You know the excitement, those moments in which you see God's possibility and God's love born in your lives. But you also know the pain of denial and betrayal. Either you've done it or you've experienced it. I'm guessing those are there are those among us who know the pain and grief of that unnamed mother. Who knows the reality of war and the violence of war, of being displaced from that which we call home, and to hold that grief in your life. Finally, I know some of us know the story of the one that has been healed, the one who's finally been welcomed into a community of faith and has experienced God's love and God's touch and been restored. 
and been told, you are enough. You are whole. You are God's child. So I invite us, as theologian Serene Jones would say, to imagine those stories that are buried beneath the lines of the text and to see ourselves in those stories, but to also know the story continues. And eventually, each and every one of those people will be silenced that week. Peter won't know what to say. That mother's hopes will be dashed by Friday. The one who was healed will wonder, was this all for nothing? But then that final line comes that even if these people are silent, the stones will cry out. Indeed, this week we will experience a deafening silence. But the theological truth of this story, and by the time we get to next Sunday, is that God persists in that silence. In the betrayal of Peter and Judas, God's love persists. In the silence of that unnamed mother, God's voice will cry out. In the disappointment of the one who was healed, God's love will continue. That the theological truth of the stories that are told this week is that nothing, absolutely nothing, can silence God's love. No system, no person, no institution can silence that reality. The stones will cry out. The very stones we stand on will find a way to articulate God's liberating truth and love in our world. And so as you venture into this week, and whether encountering the full weight of these stories render you silenced, or whether the realities of this world and headlines that haunt us render you silenced, whether the realities of your own life leave you speechless, know that the stones will cry out. God's voice will be revealed in your life, and God's love will persist even in the most challenging and difficult circumstances. For when we're quiet, God speaks. Or when we're rendered powerless, God's power persists. When we search for God's love, it's there. Let us step out in the mystery and the sacred nature of this week and be reminded that God will continue to cry out. Amen. So month after month, you know, I, I keep coming to you and questioning everyone. <laughs> um, why would you want me as an elder? Why do you want me speaking? My life, my journey, my experience. And um, when I was reading Luke this, these, th this past week, I thought to myself, oh my God, you're so selfish. <laughs> you're questioning like why, 
Are you not sharing your story? Why are you not sharing your pain? Why are you not sharing your struggles? Um, and literally, I was kind of just told like, shut up and share. <laughs> I swear that when I come up here, I no, I don't use the most sophisticated words, but I promise you that I speak from the heart. Brandon mentioned voices, voices, voices over and over again, and The group that I advocate for, the name is Voices United, and um, and we spread hope for survivors of domestic abuse, sexual abuse, elder abuse, child abuse, like, and God keeps leading me towards that journey with your guidance. Everyone in this room, everyone on Facebook, everyone on YouTube, Brandon, this whole community, helps me keep going forward and that passage I tell you if they keep silent the very stones will cry out I could probably shut up and not say anything but even my family themselves my friends the closest people to me I know I've left a mark because my struggles Everyone feels it. <laughs> I myself was telling God to keep me silent. And he said, nope. A few months ago, you know, a Brandon did a sermon of fishing for men. And I think this is where God said, like, this is where you're going to be fishing for men, you know, getting people, spreading the word, his love, his kindness. And I'm just thankful for every single one of you guys <laughs> that continue coming, joining us online, in person. And just for your prayers, and just for our struggles. Tomorrow's going to be a very difficult day. And all I want to do is hug my family and take that pain away. And I know I can't. But I'm thankful for every single one of you guys because I know that. You guys all hold us in prayer. I know you guys share communion with us. And go get your donuts, go get your pizza, I don't know, whatever it is that you're going to eat with us right now and have communion. But um, thank you. It's a powerful reminder, Liz, of voice and all those voices being welcome at this table. And so however you come to this meal, whatever you believe about this space, know that your voice is welcome. And so we practice that story as we do every week, that Jesus was gathered with his closest friends. And after giving thanks, he broke bread, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a similar way, he took a cup, and after giving thanks, poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, given for you and for all. Each time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In a few moments, we will take the bread together, and then Mario will lead us in the Lord's Prayer, and I invite us then to take the cup together. But let us partake by taking the bread together. We use many words to make them, including Yahweh, Creator, Father, Mother, Adonai, Abba, and Sustainer.
Please use the name of God and praises in the Lord's Prayer that sustains your prayer life. Please join us in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to start off today's announcements by inviting you to support our missions and ministries. Please consider donating using the link that I think is in the chat. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in the chat. Donations will go to help organizations such as BTAC, where we pack lunches for people in need, Family Promises, Family Promise, where we house families that are transitioning from homelessness, and other things. And now, Brandon, with the rest of the announcements. Thanks, Wesley and Mario. Yes, we have a lot of things going on in this community of faith. Um, a number of things happening this week. I'll run few, through a few of those. Ooh. But at the, at the entrance is a, a little card with a reminder of the Monday Thursday service and the fact that the sanctuary will be open on Good Friday. Hang this on your refrigerators, hand it out to friends, but it's a way to remind you of the activities for this week. We also continue with our weekly activities. On Wednesday evening, we have a study a study at 7 p.m. and that's on ooh, I hear him. study at, at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Is anybody else hearing that? Okay. Keep going. All right. Um, and then Thursday at 8 p.m. we'll still have our weekly reflection group. Um, if you want information about any of those opportunities, please see the weekly email that goes out on Tuesdays. If you're not on that email list, let us know and we'll make sure to include you. Also, a reminder, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, but we have changed the time of worship. This announcement will go out again and again this week. Worship will be at 11 a.m., and then we will have a meal following worship with Sigil, prepared by Homemade Thursdays. So plan to be here at 11 a.m. next week, and if you don't have plans to have meal, a meal with a family, stick around. It will be a good meal, and it will be an opportunity to get to know one another and spend some time with Sigil. Also, thanks to Nancy Hurst, who did put together the Palm Crosses again this year. And yay, thank you, Nancy. Those are at the entryway. Take those home. It'll be a reminder of the journey this upcoming week. And thanks to Nancy for putting those together. Those are a lot of announcements. There is one last announcement I'll touch on. Uh, the Queer Fellowship Group, which typically meets the last Sunday of the month, will not meet this month because of the number of activities going on, but they will resume in May. If you want information about that, reach out to Britt. Uh, she has all the information about what that group will be doing. Yeah, additionally, if you don't have my contact information, you can get it from Brandon. I'm happy to text, email, or whatever's comfortable for anybody that would like more information about when we're meeting next. Yes, I have Rick's, Britt's contact information. If you, you want do. it, I will give it to you because I now have permission. Um, I can anyway, if you, if you have any questions about any of the things happening in this church, please reach out to the leadership and we'll make sure to try to answer those questions. Now, with all that's going on in this world, I invite us to stand as we are able and join together in the closing song. Thank you, and I just want to give everyone a heads up that this arrangement of How Great Thou Art is a little bit different from the usual. So kind of in line with this theme of waiting, of holding back of preparation. We're not actually gonna sing the full chorus until the very end. The slides will indicate where we're at, but I know it can be really easy to get caught up in the majesty, so I just wanted to let everyone know.
of God, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the sufferings. Honor all persons. Honor all creation. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with each and every one of us. Let us go in peace. Amen. <laughs>